And so I'll start by introducing the panelists we have with us today. Um, so today's presentation is really going to be centered around answering the questions that you all have for us. Um, I'll be hosting. My name is Mitchell O'Neill. I'm with the New York Natural Heritage Program. Um, and we have some other uh, staff from the IMAP team at the New York Natural Heritage Program with us, um, including Jennifer Dean and Meg Wilkinson. And panelists, uh, we have some experts from the Department of Agriculture and Markets, as well as New York State Integrated Pest Management. So we can start with uh, Tom Algeyer. Hi, I'm Tom Algeyer, the Invasive Species Coordinator with New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. And then next, I think we'll go to Ethan. Yeah, thanks, Mitchell. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ethan Angel. I'm the field operations manager at New York State Agri Markets for the Division of Plant Industry. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks. And then next is Michael Giambalvo. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Giambalvo. I'm an assistant horticulture inspector, too, with New York State Agriculture and Markets Plant Division. Thank you. And then with IPM, we have Brian Eschenauer. Good evening. I'm Brian Eschenauer with Cornell's Integrated Pest Management Program. Um, and I work a lot with Spotted Lanterfly Education right now. Glad to be here this evening. Thanks. Um, and so, like I said, my name's Mitchell O'Neill. I'm the end user support specialist. So my role is helping people use the New York State Mesa Species Database, uh, IMAP Invasives. And maybe before we begin, uh, maybe could someone from Ag and Markets uh, explain like the role that Ag and Markets plays in spotted lantern flying? Yeah, so uh, New York State Agriculture and Markets um, under Article 14, which is our plant pest law, has authority to regulate, control, eradicate uh, plant pest issues that affect uh, the state, specifically agricultural production. Uh, spotted lanternfly obviously is one of those pests we're very concerned about its impacts to um, our fruit production, uh, specifically grapes. Um, New York State is the third largest grape producing state in the United States. Uh, we're second in apples. Um, we are the we are the largest fruit producing state on the East Coast, minus citrus. Um, so we have a huge economic value in our fruit crops and very diverse uh, group of food crops that are grown here in New York State. Um, our role in Spotted Lanternfly is the agency. We have many agencies that uh, come in to help and support the efforts in Spotted Lanternfly. Um, and the program is multifaceted. It includes a uh, survey, which is, uh, you know, involves visual survey and, and traps looking for Spotted Lanternfly. Education outreach programs such as this and other programs where we, where we engage the public and, and uh, the growing communities to get them to understand about the impacts of spotted lanternfly and to assist us. Um, there's a regulatory approach uh, that goes on. Um, we have an exterior quarantine on other states that have spotted lanternfly and soon uh, a quarantine here in New York on spotted lanternfly. And uh, so, you know, those are the approaches that we have in Spotted Lanternfly on a program basis. Uh, again, I mentioned, you know, we're the lead agency coordinating the efforts. We have a great federal partner in uh, USDA uh, that helps provide funding and support in the state uh, for Spotted Lanternfly. And then we have a whole host of, of state partners, uh, all the way from the state agencies to other cooperating agencies at municipal and city levels, as well as university systems. And, and obviously, Brian Eschauser being on here uh, from the New York State IPM program is a, is a key partner for us in, in uh, almost all of our plant pest programs. So that's that's really where New York State Ag and Markets is situated when it comes to spotted lantern fly. And we also coordinate uh, efforts from the prisms between unspotted lantern fly. So we kind of, that's more my role, um, coordinating the prism efforts between. You know, us in the prism and, and as far as it relates to spotted lantern fly as well. And for you, for those that don't know, the prisms are the partnerships for invasive species management, which are uh, NGOs. There's eight regions that within New York State, and they're kind of scattered throughout the state. Some of them are, are in areas where spotted lantern fly has been found, and some most are not, thankfully. Thank you. Um, and so we'll, we can get started with some of the questions from the audience now. One question is, are there any animals that eat spotted lanternfly that could help control the population? Uh, 
Yeah, and, and Mitch, if you could go to um, a slide that we have on this. So this is a really interesting question, and there's a researcher at Penn State who um, is doing some citizen science because he knows people are out there in South Central Pennsylvania, spotted lanternfly is everywhere, and people are observing things. So um, he has asked for submissions, pictures, so he can verify what people are telling him. And they've developed a list of predators and their top five bird predators are over there on your right hand side. So that's chickens. So if you have backyard chickens, they will eat spotted lanternfly. There's nothing uh, that has been noted about different taste of eggs, but you do wonder. <laughs> um, cardinals, catbirds, blue jays, tufted titmouse. Um, and then the for insects, arthropods or other types of insects uh, that feed on them. Praying mantis is number one. Yellow jackets, uh, which are really a scavenger and, and really do a service for nature, even though they uh, give us nasty stings. Uh, apparently they will eat spotted lanternfly. Uh, so, uh, the orb weaving spider, that's the big uh, spider that has the zigzag in the web and the wheel bug and even ants have been seen eating on spotted lanternflies. I think they might be dead spotted lanternflies. I'm not sure about that. But as, as it says at the bottom, the most reported predator is the praying mantis. And then the next slide is, is kind of interesting too, if we take a look at that, um, the mammal predators. And we've had questions that have come up. Uh, I should say the Penn State folks have had questions coming up about will spotted lanternfly harm their dog or poison their dogs? You know, dogs are curious and uh, they see something moving. It doesn't even have to be moving for a dog. They'll eat anything really. And there have been some reports of dogs getting sick, but I, apparently from what we're hearing, it's just that it's an irritant, kind of like them eating a piece of mulch. And so dogs will uh, sometimes bring that kind of thing up. But cats, you know, something moving, they're gonna bat it around and, and eat that. And then some small animals like squirrels and chipmunks Bats, that's interesting that a uh, bat has been seen uh, eating spotted lanternfly. And at the bottom there, toddler. So, you know, get out the animal crackers so <laughs> the young children aren't eating spotted lanternfly. But I, again, you know, curiosity. And then fish, I thought this was really interesting. I don't know the story behind this. So African cichlid, to me, that's saying that somebody who has an aquarium dropped a spotted lanternfly in there and their cichlid that they have in the aquarium is large enough that it is eating the spotted lanternfly. But in nature, bass, bluegill, uh, sunfish, and some other things are, have eaten spotted lanternfly. And then uh, frogs, toads, and even garter snakes. So uh, hopefully, you know, they will develop an appetite for uh, spotted lanternfly. There was some concern at first, and some birds are leaving them alone because they are brightly colored. Generally, brightly colored insects are assigned to the predators that I don't taste good, and uh, you might want to stay away. And certainly, when, with its wing spread, the spotted lanternfly is uh, brightly colored, like the monarch butterfly. Oh, well, thank you. Another question we have is, does Spotted lanternfly need Tree of Heaven to survive. Um, is Tree of Heaven its only host plant? I'll give Brian a break. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's not its only, it's it, it's its favorite host. It's a preferred host, but it's not the only host. Um, the, the host that we know, as far as we know, the host list is about 70 plants long. Uh, it does not need, uh, there's been some research in, in Pennsylvania that it does not need uh, tree of heaven or Lathis altissima to reproduce. It can use other alternate hosts. Uh, again, uh, Ethan mentioned, you know, apples, hops, grapes, things like that, that are of economic value. There's also uh, black walnut, maple. Um, so there's quite a long list of, of host plants. It's not just tree of heaven. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not a biocontrol for, for tree of heaven, which some of us kind of had hoped in the beginning, but uh, it's, it's definitely a a pest of some, you know, a broad range of plants. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'll go out on a limb though and say that if it's in a new area, you're probably most likely to see it on an Alanthus tree, a tree of heaven, 
Um, I followed some new areas in Pennsylvania that were newly infested and for the first couple of years, only seeing it on the Atlantis. And then after that population builds up, then it's on some other trees, but uh, yeah, it's important to look everywhere, but especially the Atlantis. Thank you.